So my name is Gregor Murray, and I'm a, a, a prof at the School of Industrial Relations at Université de Montréal, and a director of the uh, CRIMP partnership, a co-director with uh, with Christian Levesque. And uh, we're we're really pleased about uh, this activity, uh, and we want to thank you all for being there. Um, the 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 level of participation is quite impressive. Um, let's say that the pandemic allows us to do things that we couldn't previously do. We have more than 500, uh, for, for more than 200 participants uh, on multiple continents, uh, uh, China, uh, uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, North America, uh, I'm not sure about Australia. Australia. Uh, and, and uh, sorry, just if everyone could turn off their microphones, thanks. Um, and uh, we especially want to thank the people who registered twice. Uh, and, and the great thing about that is you don't know who you are. Um, so uh, uh, we won't tell anyone. Uh, and I probably include myself in that. Um, the other thing that's interesting about uh, this activity is it's a, it's a double convergence. Uh, it's a convergence of three organizations, our CRIMP partnership, uh, with great thanks to Nicolas Roby and Audrey Fortier for the work that they've done to help put this together, but also CALS, which is the Canadian Association of Work and Labor Studies, and CIRA, the Canadian Association of Industrial Relations. And is, is Larry Savage there? If you, yeah, Larry, if you just want to say a couple of words and activate your microphone. Uh, thanks, Gregor. B very briefly, I just uh, want to bring greetings on behalf of the executive of the Canadian Association for Work and Labour Studies, which is an academic association for labour studies uh, researchers. We're very much looking forward to this event, and I hope that we can pursue similar collaborations in the future. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Larry. And likewise for Patrice Jallet. If you want to activate your microphone, Patrice. Yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the colleagues who, ex the eminent colleagues who accepted to act as commentators during this webinar. Thank you. I'm sure that you will raise a, a quite a pertinent question about the corporation. Uh, congratulations also to the makers of the film who have uh, highlighted the need to study underst and understand the logic and strategies of this institution at the art of industrial relation. And just one, one last word. Uh, we would like to uh, invite you to, uh, to, to join us to continue this conversation at the next Canadian Industrial Relations uh, Congress that will take place on virtual mode from May 26 to May 28. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Patrice. Now that's one aspect of the convergence in that we were able to bring uh, our research network and these two associations together uh, in a common endeavor, um, and the footprint is well beyond Canada in this respect, because the participation today is is very much international. Um, and the other aspect is simply that uh, uh, we have uh, six fantastic participants, uh, starting with Joel Bakken, to, to, to whom we owe great thanks for the work that he's done over several decades, which uh, I, I think if we could do a straw poll, Joel, and find out what proportion of people on this webinar have actually used your film or your films in teaching mode, uh, it would be it would be at least two thirds and maybe ninety percent. So that that gives you an idea that uh, you are an icon, which doesn't mean we want to give you an easy time. Uh, it just means that we want you to celebrate your status as an icon. Um, and from there, uh, we have uh, five fantastic participants, uh, uh, and, and John Peters from uh, Laurentian University. So he's uh, uh, from a hard nickel town, but uh, uh, spending his time on the Newfoundland and Labrador coast uh, during the pandemic. So another part of the resource economy and a specialist in financialization. We have Rose Batt. Uh, at Cornell University, the ILR School, who has done extensive work on financialization and its implications for Main Street. Uh, we have Isabel Ferreras, who is our motor of social change 
uh, democratization of the firm and everything else you can imagine from uh, uh, Louvain in Belgium, but I think she's at, at home in Brussels. Uh, we have Isabelle Martin, who is at the School of Industrial Relations at Université de Montréal and a specialist in uh, um, CSR, corporate social responsibility, uh, obviously with a critical edge here. Uh, and we have, uh, who are we missing? One, two, three, four. Jim Stanford, none other than Jim Stanford, who you know from the West Coast. He's uh, sharing a time zone with Joel. Uh, so they're up breakfast time to do this seminar, whereas we have people who are in China who are watching it uh, in the late evening. Um, so we, and, and Jim, it should be mentioned, uh, last week uh, brought out a wonderful report. I'm looking for the title because it's a, it's a great title, Speaking Up, Being Heard, Making Change, The Theory and Practice of Worker Voice in Canada. And it's a great report, which I think speaks directly to what we want to talk about today. So the format we're going to use is the following. We're going to have an interview, uh, which I'll conduct with Joel, and he'll have a chance to go back and forth on some of his thinking about the film, the core themes. That will last about 25 minutes. And then we've asked our commentators, discussants, to come in five or six minutes each and on their views of the film, some of the key themes, and then we'll open it up to an interactive discussion. It should not go beyond one hour, 40 minutes, which means that we're gonna be tight on the discussion time. Some of you will have to leave. That's how it works, but we won't go beyond that time, not least because Joel has to teach. So he uh, offered to do this webinar before he went into the classroom, just to, just to kind of warm up, he usually does. Uh, an hour or two of of <laughs> of this kind of exercise before he teaches. It's 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 performative, right, Joel? So, Joel, let's start. And what I wanted to uh, ask you, and I'll ask you to correct me if I've got the interpretation wrong, uh, is that uh, you did the corporation in 2004. Uh, at first, the corporate world said uh, he's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Then came the financial crisis. It was an epiphany. Uh, and they began showing your film at Davos and in other forums in every MBA classroom. And they said, we need to do good. And in a tremendous bout of therapeutic healing uh, and resilience, your new film is a celebration of the transformed corporation. Have I got that right? No, no, not not at all. To begin with, they probably still think I'm an idiot. Um, that the shift happened around 2005, not 2008. And my film is a um, uh, deep and far reaching critique of the idea that corporations have changed rather than a celebration. So I thank you for getting all three uh, aspects wrong so that I now can uh, can engage you all. So number one mistake, I think it was it was actually after the first film uh, we were making the film when, of course, protesters were in the streets around the world in in Prague and Seattle, what's come to be known as the uh, anti globalization uh, movement. Um, and uh, I think corporations were, were shaken by that. Uh, and I actually was filming at the very first of those, the precursor to the WTO protests in Seattle, uh, which was the APEC meeting, which was taking place on my campus. I was literally sitting in my office and watching events unfold and went out and uh, had a copy of the Constitution in my hand and was confronting police officers and whatnot to absolutely no effect. Um, and 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 we were we were actually filming some of that. It didn't end up in the first film. But so it was really around that ferment in the early 2000s that you see corporations start to say, we really need to uh, become better. We acknowledge that we were bad. And right after my book and film came out, I, you know, the phone started ringing off the hook and it wasn't sort of trade unions and environmental groups that were asking me to come speak to them. It was corporate groups. And, and the story was always something like, you know, thank you, Joel, for, uh, for diagnosing the problem with the corporation. We appreciate it. We're on it. You know, we got the message. 
uh, and we're fixing it and we're becoming better. And so the basic sort of idea that this went under was we understand that social responsibility was a fairly peripheral commitment and we're going to change that. We're now going to bake it into the very core of our operations. And, and so that's what you started to see, 100% sustainability, recycling, using less water, renewable energy. That all happens around 2005. And I would say the lead uh, company was General Electric and its eco-imagination program. That was sort of the first big major program that you see in 2005. Um, you're right, Gregor, that 2008 definitely caused a kind of doubling down on that idea. Um, and so to that extent, the, it, it, it kind of ramps up starting in 2005 and then 2008 again. Uh, the Occupy movement comes out of that sort of 2010, 2011. You start to see uh, the various movements of the squares uh, starting in the Middle East and moving to Spain and, and to Greece uh, and ultimately to Zuccotti Park in New York. And so another big kind of uprising and another hand wringing moment for corporations um, and, and their leaders saying, you know, this thing that we started in 2005, now we really have to, uh, we have to really commit uh, to being good. And uh, then I, I think what, uh, what, what happens in, in the third piece, I mean, Gregor, you, you said I'm celebrating this and quite the contrary, I'm, I'm making two arguments uh, in both the book and film and in the book, it's obviously easier and we can talk about this if people want different media and how you can do critical work in them. Uh, it's easier in the book. It's actually even easier for me in an academic work, so I'm, I'm struggling in the book with trying to write a more popular book and trying to translate complicated ideas into a uh, more accessible form. But basically, I make two arguments in the, uh, in the book and film. The first argument is kind of a reiteration of the argument that's made in the first work, which is that, yes, corporations doubled down on this idea of goodness, but they are exactly the same as they were before. And that, you know, if they were psychopaths before, now they've discovered charm. So they've become charming psychopaths. And coincidentally, in 2011, the um, American Psychiatric Association amended its psychopath uh, checklist to include charm and glibness. Uh, so that was very helpful. And you see that in the film and in, in the book. So that's one idea is what you're seeing uh, is, is not what you're actually getting. But the second idea, and I think the more profound idea in the book and film, is that CSR and corporate sustainability and all of that um, have changed. That they used to be about trying to kind of cover up or modify the, the bad behavior of corporations, you know, to, to provide a, a kind of a gloss on, on the activity of corporations, kind of a marketing and PR kind of thing. Um, but the change that we note in the film, and again, I do this more explicitly in the book, is that now it's become actually a collective class strategy for capital to gain more power, actually to gain complete power. Uh, to basically push government out of the social sphere, out of the environmental sphere, out of the regulatory sphere, out of the uh, social provision sphere, and to take over those things, to self-regulate, to privatize, to push back taxes. And the good corporation has become the kind of uh, the, the velvet glove that the fist of neoliberalism is now in, the smiling face of neoliberalism. So no longer do we have the kind of Milton Friedman idea that you know markets are good because markets are good and we're inherently self-interested people and we're sort of rationally maximizing our welfare and all that. Now the idea is it's not about selfishness. It's not about self-interest. We corporations, we the capitalist class care. We are benevolent, noblesse oblige. And so you should give us your schools, give us your water systems, let us regulate ourselves. So this is a much more profound use 
of corporate social responsibility and sustainability. It's, it's become, in effect, um, an ideological play and movement of the capitalist class, no longer just a kind of marketing and public relations strategy. So there's a lot of content there, which we're clearly going to get on to on the, from the various comments. Just a, a, an easy question. I suspect that 2004, you said, I'm never going to do this again, i.e. do a film. Um, uh, when did you decide that you were going to do a new one? I actually remember the precise moment when I decided, and it was 10 years after the film came out, we were celebrating it. Uh, we were, we had rented a theater downtown, we had champagne, and it was like, wow, isn't this wonderful? We did this film 10 years ago, people are still watching it. And it was halfway through the screening of that film, and I realized we have absolutely nothing to celebrate. Every single thing that we talked about in that first film, exploitation of labor, climate change, colonialism, uh, all of it had gotten worse. Corporations had become bigger, more monopolistic. We now had big tech on the scene. Um, and moreover, corporations were now claiming to be the solution to the world's problems, and people were buying that. And so I thought that this kind of uh, confluence of things um, suggested that the first film had been an absolute failure. Uh, you know, if the objective of the first film was to put a check on corporate capitalism, uh, corporate capitalism had just kind of was on steroids over the 10 years after it came out. Uh, so uh, I, I thought it's, it's time to start thinking about a, uh, a sequel. And, and that was before Donald Trump was president. I mean, that's, that's you know, while, uh, while Obama was president of the United States. But it was still very clear that, that neoliberalism had had become entrenched in a qualitatively different way uh, than it had been 10 years before, and that its ideological sort of um, packaging uh, had changed. So, And, and can we anticipate, Joel, first of all, was there, in, in revisiting the corporation, the original film, and looking at the analysis advanced in that, um, were there things that you say, oh my God, why didn't, we developed this argument at that time, or rather it's the rest of the world that changed, and that's why you needed to make a second film. Yeah, door number two. Um, I, I felt, I mean, you know, as, as much as was possible, I felt that in the first film and book, we we sort of covered what, what needed uh, to be covered. And I guess what we, what we anticipated, I mean, we talked about the corporation had become the dominant institution of our time. And I think the tone of the film was, this is a warning that if, if we don't change course, we, we may end up with uh, being kind of, with our democracy being uh, uh, seriously corroded by, by this. Um, and and I, I think we did make that, I think we did make that warning. The unfortunate thing is that we were right. And, and I'm looking forward to the prequel where you go back to the foundation of the corporation, but that will be in another 10 years. Um, am I right in thinking that there is a tension in the new film between competing narratives? And, and the tension is a creative and an interesting one. On the one hand, you have your all-seeing corporation, the argument that you've been making uh, that can control every aspect of our lives, uh, that we all have Alexis in the corner, uh, and that uh, uh, this is this is a su successfully constructed uh, collective class strategy, as you are arguing. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we have the counter movements and the individuals and the movements that you highlight in the last third of the film. So there we have social housing in Barcelona. We have the fight for 15. In Seattle, we have Occupy Wall Street. We have the the um, uh, Adani Carmichael mine and and Aboriginal uh, land claims in Australia. Uh, and and uh, we have Black Lives Matter and and the Reverend William Barber and others making the arguments over uh, 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 the the need for for protest and the kinds of protests on the street, um, even to the degree that you indicate how. 
uh, not a, a bucket of coal uh, or a container ship of coal has come out of the Adani Carmichael mine. So could could you address this this these competing narratives you have here? Because on the one hand, we've got the implacable Joel Bakken and co uh, making the argument of this impeccably constructed and successful discourse. And on the other hand, we have these counter movements. And you say, well, what's the surprise there? But I, I think I think that that's one something that we if you could if you could address that tension, if you see it as a tension or a creative one. Well, it's it's a it's it's more than a creative tension. It's it's the tension that that we're living in uh, as uh, as humanity. Um, that is the tension that we at once are subject to unjust and totalizing um, power regimes, and and on the other, uh, we resist, um, and and we resist in the name of uh, of human values, of, of values of justice, of values. Of saving the planet, so I don't see them so much as as competing narratives as I do as uh, necessary narratives to explain the human condition. And I think the best way to understand that is to the the, the modeling of this film, the kind of narrative construct that that I had in mind in modeling it was actually a zombie film. And I don't know um, if, if people are affectionados of this genre, so I'll just explain it briefly. That in a zombie film, you usually start the film in a fairly bucolic town where everybody's happy. And, you know, the, the, the sort of paper person is throwing the newspaper and there are white picket fences and the sun is shining. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice setting. And so that's our opening. That's our Davos is this everybody's happy, the, the corporations are good, all of that. But in the zombie film, what, what quickly emerges is that many of those people who seem nice, uh, the barber, the bartender, the candlestick maker, um, that these, um, uh, the butcher and the baker, uh, just to complete that metaphor from Adam Smith, um, that all of these people are actually not human beings, but they're flesh eating zombies uh, who have inhabited human bodies and that they're they're evil and nasty and they're going to destroy the town. And so then you get the second part of the film, which is the destruction of the town by these zombies who initially appear benevolent and now we realize they're uh, they're horrible and monstrous. The third part of the film, the third act, uh, begins in uh, the basement of the, the local church and a group of surviving human beings, non-zombies, surviving human beings are are hiding out in and are hiding from the zombies and the destruction and they find each other and they realize that together, collectively, they can organize and and have the power to push back against the zombies. And so they emerge from the church basement, they battle the zombies and they win. In the case of our film, the ending may be a bit more uncertain than your typical zombie film, but but that is the structure. And so I'm not sure that they're competing narratives as much as they are uh, a, a dramatic narrative that I think very much uh, describes where we're at, um, which is, and, and I don't know who's going to win, but what I do know is that over the last 10 years, I would say beginning with Occupy, which is where we begin, the third act of the film uh, and culminating with uh, the, the BLM movements recently and the climate movements and everything else, we're seeing uh, a, a, a kind of invigoration of social movements, of labor movements, of anti-colonialist movements um, that is, uh, I think, reflecting the, uh, the, the 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 very challenging circumstances we're in. Uh, in other words, the the movements are are stepping up to just how severe and existentially uh, sort of crisis situation we're in on so many fronts. And I don't know how it's going to end. I, I guess you know I'll, I'll make a film in ten years, uh, and hopefully it'll be a film about the um, uh, the 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 world turning to. Uh, to justice and democracy and humanity.
Now, you've got different lines of, we'll call it struggle, uh, of, of, of influence. Um, of course, the, the state uh, can intervene, and, and you do quite a comprehensive job on the state in terms of the, the corrosion of politics and the, the um, making, making laws ineffective. But nonetheless, you can think of regulation. Um, you can also think of resistance, which is well illustrated. Uh, is there any scope for uh, uh, self-reform or reform from within? In other words, and, and I'll give the example, a lot of us meet managers all the time, uh, managers who are concerned about the jobs and the communities from which they're issued, managers who don't necessarily want to do ill, but rather want to do good, and some are given license to do good. So is there is there scope for... Uh, uh, some elements of uh, social innovation from within firms, or you're saying as long as a firm doesn't want to pay taxes, um, uh, there's little that you can do. What's 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 your take on this? Given given that the the people who are really shaken up by your films are managers. That's what I've tended to see, uh, mm -hmm. saying, "Oh my God, am I like that? Is that what I do?" Yeah, I mean, and and you know, some of my best friends are corporate managers, um, and uh, are or were? No, are. I mean, you know, I I I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of saying that you know, people. Oh, some of my best friends are whatever, whatever. But some of my best friends, you know, I are corporate lawyers certainly, and people who work in in the corporate sector. And my problem has never been with the individuals and their intentions and their values and their moral sensibilities. My problem is with the institution and uh, not just the institution of the corporation, but the institutions of capitalism, of finance, of financialization, the incentives that those create, the imperatives that they insist upon, and the way that we're kind of as individuals always struggling between our inherent sensibilities as human beings and the demands of the institutions that we're part of. And so the example that I use, uh, it's a very Canadian example that I use in the book uh, is hockey. Uh, and it's a game I love, it's a game I've played, it's a game I've coached, I'm, I'm not particularly good at it. And when I play it, I tend to be a kind of chippy and somewhat violent player to make up for my lack of skills. Um, so, uh, and, and, and so the, 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 the way I see it is the corporation is kind of like a hockey game. Um, hockey is an inherently violent sport. It has a set of rules uh, and a set of imperatives. You uh, have movements within the sort of hockey establishment that say, let's make it less violent. And you have people on the other side saying, let's keep it the way it is. And so you have some slight changes in the rules, no more checking of the heads, no more cross-checking into the boards. But basically, you're never going to have a hockey game where one team gives away the puck to the other team and the goalie steps aside to allow the other team to put the puck in the net. That would not be hockey anymore, that kind of cooperative we all care about, you know, we, we all win when we all win. I mean, that is not the game of hockey. And so in the same way, a corporation has certain rules. And, you know, I began this whole journey as, as a legal scholar, looking at the law that creates and defines corporations. Um, and, you know, some of you are working in the space of trying to change that institutional structure, that legal structure of the firm. And I think that's really important work. But so long as that structure is there, uh, managers have an obligation, they have a legal obligation, directors and managers, to make decisions that serve the best interests of the firm. And those best interests are typically defined in the law as being the financial best interest, the financial return to investors. Now, you can tinker with that. You can be a super enlightened manager, but the most enlightened manager in that situation can say, at best, I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of my shareholders' interest. 
I'm willing to sacrifice their short term interests for their long term interests. I'm willing to do a little bit around the edges and maybe cause them a little bit less benefit in order to pursue some social or environmental benefit. That's the best they can do. More likely, they're going to say, if I pursue this social or environmental benefit, that's going to create a better return for the shareholders. That's the usual, you know, doing, doing well by doing good scenario that you get even among the most enlightened managers. So the managers are trying to reconcile their morality with their institutional positions. And the best they can do is the kind of win-win scenario or doing well by doing good scenario, or maybe saying, we'll sacrifice a little bit of shareholder value for these other values. But they can't, they can't say, we're actually going to sacrifice our shareholders' values substantially. As if they started to do that, not only would they be acting unlawfully, not only would be, they be at the other end of lawsuits, but capitalism, as we know, it would come to a grinding halt because the whole financial industry that sits on top of this set of incentives wouldn't be able to function anymore. It would be deprived of the fuel that runs it and it would just collapse. So, I mean, let's say thought experiment that, you know, managers got together at the, the business round table. And instead of this sort of Jamie Dimon fluff about how we have to care about communities and all of that, they made an agreement among themselves, the 200 top US uh, uh, CEOs made an agreement among themselves that they were going to cut the return on investment by 50% in order to pay workers more, in order to put in environmental safeguards, in order to pay more taxes, in order to ask the government to regulate them. So this was what they agreed to. And they walked out of that meeting with that agreement. Capitalism would tank within a day. Now, Joel, there are many other questions I could ask you, and we could continue this discussion. And I do note that uh, if you go on Joel's website, you'll see many interviews that he's given, including a quite interesting uh, podcast recently with Russell Brand uh, in the UK. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can follow this up. But I think we want to bring the the discussants, the commentators into the conversation now so that we can hear what they have to say. We can get your reactions. And I want to remind everyone who's listening in that there will be opportunities either to ask questions through the chat if you don't want to be seen on camera, or we'll be able to take a number of limited, a limited number of live um, uh, on camera uh, questions or comments. So we'll be looking forward to that. That will be after we go through the road of comments and have some reaction from from uh, from Joel. So. Thanks very much. We have something for everyone. Zombie films, ice hockey, which could be field hockey. Pick your metaphor. It's in the film uh, or someone beyond, beyond, somewhere behind it. Uh, we're going to first ask John Peters to intervene, and then we're going to go over to Rose Bat, and then I'll tell you before Rose who's, who's up next on the rota. So thanks so much, Joel. Thank you. Over to you, John Peters in uh, Newfoundland, Labrador. What's the weather like there, uh, John, in... Uh, in on the on the coast outside of St. John's? It's, it's actually sunny today, if you can believe it. So mm -hmm. we just had uh, four days of uh, first rain, freezing rain and snow, and then we had snow, freezing rain, and then rain. So uh, we had your pick. Uh, and, and in both cases, we had winds of 100 to 150 kilometers an hour. So uh, it was a, a sort of a, an issue where I think the left often feels very much at home, right? You're, you're, you're facing uh, rather adverse uh, conditions uh, in many cases, right? So, and, and John, uh, so yeah. Do you, do you use the corporation in all your classes every session? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to tell Joel that uh, I could be part of his fan club, and you know I'd be very happy to create the fan club of the corporation heads, right? Uh, and uh, and to show it widely because uh, my students have uh, have always had their eyes opened uh, by thinking about corporations as as psychopaths. Uh, and even the business students who I have in my classes, uh, maybe they're not entirely convinced, but they certainly come out thinking very differently uh, at the end of it. 
Uh, and, you know, I think using these as sort of educational tools, uh, you know, Robert Reich's Inequality for All, uh, Bill McKibben's um, uh, Do the Math, right? All these things I, I uh, use in class, and, and I think they're so worthwhile as sort of trying to get students to think in a very different way, right? And I think, in you know, how we sort of teach today is uh, is, is very different than how we used to teach, you know, even 10 or, or 20 years ago. And, uh, and I guess that's kind of what I wanted to just ask a little bit about that, because it seems like you have given quite a bit of thought to... Uh, you know, how you try to reach, both as a legal scholar, how do you try to reach a broader audience? Uh, that's probably pretty rare for the legal scholars, I would say. Uh, that's certainly rare for most academics. Uh, but as someone who sort of likes to straddle uh, both the academic side and, in my case, the labor side, trying to, uh, you know, get very complex messages out to a, a wider audience uh, is, is, is a big hurdle all the time. Um, and, I, and, I, and the reason I sort of was thinking about this, well, there's lots of reasons, but, I, you know, it came to mind this morning as I was doom scrolling The Guardian uh, about uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, and apparently there's been some research that there's, a, there's a, essentially 12 influencers on, on Facebook. Uh, and those 12 influencers uh, have had global influence uh, talking about uh, the problems of the pandemic. Now, you can deplatform those people. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's still going to be, it's like a whack-a-mole problem. Uh, there's still going to be, you know, another 12 who are going to pop up. And then suddenly, uh, you know, all that, you know, effort that's put together by health authorities, uh, you know, and everyone else to say, look, we should get vaccinated. <laughs> we don't want to all die or have others die because of our negligence. How do you, you know, so, you know, that sort of shows the sort of the thing that you're, you're up against it in some ways. And I think the corporation and, you know, and the new corporation are great documentaries. And, and as I mentioned in, in my class, you know, trying to get that message out. But I'm wondering what other sorts of thoughts did you put into in terms of using that media? You have both a book as well as a documentary. Um, you know, what are your other thoughts, you know, about sort of using media to try to make those messages have an impact? I guess it would be my, my first question. Uh, and then just as a sort of a follow up to that, then it becomes also a political question, too. Um, you know, it's one thing to sort of educate students or labor movements uh, about the problems of the corporation. Uh, but it's another thing to sort of get them to do actions on the corporation or to take political action or to take those initial sorts of steps to sort of address the, the political problems. The environmental movement, I think, is probably the way at the forefront, in, in many cases, ahead of the labor movement and thinking about corporations. Uh, that's primarily because, you know, like Greta Thunberg and, and others, they see that uh, big oil corporations are perhaps not your most socially responsible. Uh, and in fact, there's a huge amount of research that targets the, the nature of evil uh, of the corporations and the very biggest oil corporations that are around. But that sort of key link there about corporate power and about business power is often missing in other kinds of political kinds of actions of which you mentioned a number, whether it's Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, whether it's uh, some of the uh, movements by Bernie Sanders and the Sanderistas in the United States. Uh, what's that political link? I mean, is what? How would you sort of push? Uh, and what's what's your thought about how that political culture can change so that some of those sort of older key populist concerns and those labor populist concerns about corporate power and about uh, inequality as being driven by corporate power? How do we sort of get those messages out again? And what are your thoughts about that? And what are some of the hurdles that we might have to address to to get that political culture uh, also right? At yeah. It, uh, do you I, want I'll me do, to respond? Like, or? I, I think that I think that it's going to be very frustrating, but uh, uh, so that we'll have more interaction time, you're going to have to make a note of these questions and group some of them together um, uh, so that we get several comments and then you can filter them as you will and uh, we'll bring something back up. Is that OK with you, too, John? Great. So. Thanks a lot, John, um, uh, and 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 some key questions uh, there, uh, not least uh, on the environmental side, uh, and and the incredible. Um, I, I wonder if the environmental movement is not simply going to be sidelined by uh, the tremendous corporate rush to engage with environmentalism. When I saw yesterday that Volkswagen in North America will henceforth be known as Volt. 
Volkswagen, um, it, it gives you an idea of the direction uh, we're, we're heading in this respect. Now over to you, Rose Bat, who've, who have uh, specialized for the last decade amongst many other things on private equity. And uh, I guess we can call it the discombobulation of the firm uh, as it becomes beholden to private equity funds and its implications for, as, as you put it in your book with, with Eileen Applebaum, on, for Main Street. So over to you, some of the questions that came to mind in seeing and reading the new corporation and things you'd like to discuss with Joel. Okay. And after so, that, we'll go over to Jim Stanford after Rose. So first, thank you, uh, Gregor and Krempt and the uh, labor organizations in Canada for putting this together. I think it's super important. I also want to thank you, Joel, for your path for a game book and films. And I just briefly, I you know I fundamentally agree with your analysis, so I'm not going to kind of repeat any of that. Uh, that aligning with corporations really won't work. Change with from within won't. The new corporation is fundamentally uh, the same as the old, and uh, with you know green, pink, and yellow window dressing, right? And I agree because I think, as you say, the institutional power of the billionaire class is so profound. Uh, they will embrace modest change. They will embrace diversity. Right, because they can bring in one or two um, blacks or women uh, then who have to be to play by the rules, as you say. Um, so, but their actions speak louder than words, as you say. The, tra the Trump tax breaks, and more recently, I just want to shout out what you know with the voter suppression laws in um, uh, the U.S. Corporations have done nothing. So we have Delta. Coke headquarters right in the belly of the beast. They absolutely refused to make any statement at all. And I think in talking about uh, you know democracy as key, why I think that analysis so is, is so important, and I'd like to hear more discussion, is that the Republicans and the billionaires are a minority, and that they are threatened, and the they are desperate. And the only way they will succeed is by fraud, illegal activity, and uh, fraudulent uh, elections. So that is one uh, theme. And then the second thing I want to do is I want to just make three points that don't necessarily ask questions, but that build on what you your argument is, Joel. And that is the social movement success, uh, Biden success and uh, pushing beyond it. So with respect to the local successes, I think your examples are, are terrific and we have many more of them. And you know, there is a whole group of people who are have talked about the new federalism in regulation, which is all the bubbling up of local regulations that then move to the states, uh, the fight for 15, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. So those local innovations have always been historically important as uh, proving grounds for policies. Um, the problem is that the right has been really active and successful as well. And again, you point that out in your book. And a really important dynamic right now is the preemption laws that states are passing that overturn anything going on at the local level. So that is a serious tension. And so um, having said that, that moves to the second point of why we really need to continue to move to the state and national levels in the new federalism, because that is how the civil rights movement was successful, right? Finally, after huge momentum, uh, Johnson was forced to admit that he had to pass a civil rights law. So that bubbling up, but also moving at the national level is critical. So I, I'd like us to talk about that. And Biden is successful because of the social movements and he's been pushed farther to the left than we ever expected him to be. And we already have great appointments and low hanging fruit that is being attacked through executive orders on social policy, labor policy, support for unions, economic relief uh, with the stimulus package. Now, the third point I wanna make, I think pushes us beyond this, which you mentioned, but I think we need to do more head on work with. 
And that is beyond the comfort zone of Democrats is to take on finance capital. And finance capital is in the background. Uh, they're the ones, pull, they are the puppeteers drawing, pulling on the strings of the puppets in the corporations. And so people don't understand those dynamics and they're afraid to attack finance capital because it's just too complicated, right? And so that's where we have to figure out. So I'd love to hear a discussion about how we go there. And there are great examples in the US with the similar kind of coalition bubbling up, uh, which is, um, which is, and I'm just finishing up, um, Americans for Social uh, Financial Reform, many unions, the Consumers Coalition, uh, many think tanks, better markets, all sorts of groups are actively developing strategies to take down billionaires, finance capital, Wall Street. We know of a few, I'll just highlight them and then we might get back to them, but one is the Accountable Care Capitalism Act that goes after all the financial um, uh, techniques used by corporations, as well as insisting that workers be put on boards. And the second is um, the um, Take Back Wall, Stop a Wall Street Looting Act. Now, finally, I'll just add, there is an easy thing we can also do, which is to undertake investor reform by changing the fiduciary rules. They were changed by executive order in successive presidential uh, cases. Uh, Biden just rolled back the ESG law rules under Trump, and we can free up pension funds to use their trillions, you know, 32 trillion in the US, 17 trillion in Europe, to adopt ESG principles. We have examples of that in Quebec, we know. And uh, just to highlight the final point, 35% of the investments in private equity are from pension funds. That is completely against workers' uh, interests as well as uh, public interest. And so that is another point of leverage to really go after the billionaire class. So I'll stop there. Uh, Rose, uh, thanks so much. And uh, we're going to go over to you in just a second, Jim. Can I just, uh, some people get dizzy when you start talking about fiduciary duties, Rose. And I wonder if you can just give an example of what you would mean by a change in the fiduciary duty so that people can follow the argument with regard to finance capital. Yeah, so um, a kind of thumbnail um, definition is that fiduciary duty historically meant that you have to be honest and, and not fraudulent in your dealings with the, the funds of your beneficiaries, so pension fund members. And that meant a broad definition. So that could take into account, I mean, certainly you had to get high returns, but you didn't have to get high returns at the expense of everything else. Over time, the definition became one in which it said your fiduciary responsibility is only to maximize returns, regardless of the effects in other realms. But that was a, a, a Bush era change in the rules. And there's no reason we cannot push back on that. And now there's enough momentum that you can go back to saying you have to take into account not only stock price or returns, but the long-term survival of your pensioners and your, your members through to addressing climate change. Okay, great. And, and I know, Jim, that all of these things are going to completely derail what you wanted to say, because as the author of multiple books on the bubble economy, uh, but Keep, keep to the film if you can and, and say whatever you want. And after Jim, we'll go over to Isabel Martin. Gregor, thank you. And uh, thank you, Joel. Uh, first of all, congratulations to you and your team uh, for this work. Uh, very powerful, uh, very timely. Uh, uh, such a shocking, damning litany <laughs> of what global corporations are doing today. It, it's just a very powerful and influential uh, piece. Uh, I, I was especially struck uh, by the way you connected the dots uh, between uh, corporate demands for tax cuts, first of all, 
followed by fiscal restraint to address the deficits that resulted from the tax cuts, followed by privatization of public services that are in shitty quality because of the fiscal restraint, followed by the same corporations riding in on their white horse to save the day with some kind of, um, you know, uh, private social uh, initiative. Uh, that story of the Bridge International uh, Academies, I, I was not aware of that. And I, I tell you, I picked up something to throw at the TV uh, while I was watching that bit of it. Uh, I held myself back. It sounds like a grand conspiracy, doesn't it? Um, and, and the problem is when you recognize conspiracies, you start sounding like a lunatic uh, of some kind, right? A tin hat and, and everything. But I have learned over the years uh, that just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not following you, okay? So um, in that regard, we have to take the possibility of these conspiracies, you know, from the Mont Pelerin Society on down, uh, seriously. Uh, luckily, I didn't break the TV uh, by the time we got to the end of the movie and, and some of the hopeful messages that, that were there. And I especially, I wrote this one down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it printed and framed, was the, uh, the quote from that uh, wonderful city councillor in Seattle, uh, Kishana Sa Sawant. I hope I'm saying that name right. You don't need a PhD in economics to know that your life sucks under capitalism. Uh, and I have a PhD in economics, okay? So I'm not trying to devalue my own credentials here, but uh, she's absolutely right. Um, I want to throw one nuance into the discussion around corporate social responsibility, which of course is a contradiction in terms. And yes, the commitments that these companies are making are shallow and meaningless and unenforceable. And yes, the structures and forces uh, of capitalism, uh, and in particular, the competition for profit that drives capitalism, will quickly overcome any of those shallow commitments, those feel-good uh, gestures, uh, because they, they have to. It, it is, the system doesn't do this just because there's greedy assholes running it. Uh, yes, there are greedy assholes running it, but there are other, other people who have more morals running it as well. And they do these things because the system forces them to do these things because they'd be out of business if they didn't do these things. And uh, there, there is also a, a huge risk of these sort of shallow initiatives overwhelming or replacing what should be done, which is uh, accountability, transparency, regulation, and ultimately, in many cases, public ownership of these activities rather than having them assigned to these private institutions. Uh, the nuance that I would add is that the, the fact that companies feel they have to do this shows to me that they're worried. Uh, they are worried about their legitimacy in the long run in a kind of a deep cultural sense as well as a political sense and, and, a, and a policy sense. And it shows that we have some power. So you know, to some extent, I think we should feel empowered by this litany of, of abuse and the critique of the shallowness of these company uh, gestures. In, in a sort of a, in a Gramscian lens, maybe, uh, we can see that uh, the common sense wisdom in society about corporations, what they are and what they do is changing. Here's one example. The Pew Center in the U.S. does a, an annual poll of uh, public attitudes towards different institutions, including corporations, unions, government, the media, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the latest one um, that came out a couple months ago showed the public support for corporations and what they do at the lowest level since the Pew Center began this poll something like 50 years ago, um, which shows that, uh, again, particularly in the pandemic, I mean, this is just galling when you see uh, the business sector and the financial sector making um, record, uh, historic, all-time profits from human misery around us, um, you know, again, you don't need a PhD in economics to figure out that's wrong. Um, so I, I think that there's some, uh, there's a grain of hope in that, not in the sense that I'm endorsing these uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. We should be skeptical and critical of them. Um, but even some of the campaigns that are pushing companies, I'm thinking, say, of the divestment campaigns that you see, you know, in many uh, universities, for example, and other institutions trying to pull money out of um, the fossil fuel industry. And just like we did with South Africa years ago, um, if somebody came and told me by pulling the money out, we're going to starve the fossil fuel industry of capital and thereby wrestle it to the ground, uh, I would say bullshit. Uh, that is not how capitalism works. As long as producing fossil fuels is a legal and profitable opportunity, the money will flow in there to do it, even if it comes from private equity firms that don't have to go through the trouble of corporate social responsibility statements or whatever. On the other hand, these divestment campaigns are taking advantage of a platform where we can critique the 
the legitimacy and social license of these businesses. So when a big university says we're pulling our money out of fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry is aghast, not because it means they don't have money anymore, uh, but because their um, uh, their legitimacy has been attacked uh, again. And I think that that is something that we can build on. Um, on the other hand, the ultimate solution to change, as, as Joel's work has pointed out, is not um, uh, not these sort of voluntary uh, initiatives or informal pressure. It's formal uh, and forcible legal measures to bring about transparency and accountability uh, to to workers and communities and the environment. And and we shouldn't settle for anything less. When we see companies getting worried about their reputation and doing things like this, we should know that they, in a way, we have them on the run. And we should demand something bigger from them. And uh, I know Joel's uh, on board with that, and and his work uh, is just a, an enormous, enormous uh, asset on our side of the argument. So thank you again for what you've done. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. And just to Thanks, just to Jim. take up this point for for subsequent discussion, your idea of formal, enforceable, transparent, legal mechanisms. Did I get a takeaway from the film that these are bound to fail because of the nature and distribution of power in society? Or it's 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 that's part of that counter narrative that you you have things happening on the one hand with regard to the way corporations operate, but that um, legal legal enforceable measures uh, actually change the directionality of how firms are operating. Because I hear that from you, uh, and maybe I hear heard it a little from the economist and a little less from the law professor. But the law professor can defend himself afterwards. Would that be now or yes? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I don't know whether you wanted to answer that, Jim. Your mic is off. Sorry, Gregor, I thought you were asking Joel the question. No, um, it, it's just to check you out on, on you're putting hope in legal, enforceable, transparent yeah. mechanisms. Like, like paying your taxes mm -hmm. <laughs> and respecting a collective agreement and uh, living up to the, the law uh, on environmental standards. Those are the things that will change corporate behavior, and they would prefer to not have to do those things. And, the, and, and part of their feel-good CSR strategy is to try and circumvent those measures. And this is why I say we, we've got them on the run. Here's an example is this stupid thing Uber came out with uh, the other week uh, in Canada, and they've tried it elsewhere, uh, that instead of being forced to treat their drivers like workers, okay, which is happening in the courts, this is being determined in the courts all over the world, they want to voluntarily pay a little bit of a, uh, a benefit premium above the normal very low rates that the drivers get. Uh, and that will give them a fund, uh, basically a personal fund that each driver can use to cover things like uh, retirement saving or sick pay or all the other things that normally go with a job. And, uh, you know, it's pathetic. It's, it's dangerous, but it's a sign that Uber is worried. And so, you know, in a way, this is a an opening for us to say, no, Uber, uh, your workers do deserve retirement savings and sick pay and workers' compensation. And by the way, uh, this is not how they're going to get it. So, um, you know, uh, the we are, we are fore, uh, forewarned and, and forearmed by Joel's critique of these uh, superficial measures, uh, which is good. But I, I, I'm optimistic that through political mobilizing, and power, we can get something better than that. That's that's where I take a grain of hope from it all. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. And uh, this is an ideal segue over to our labor law professor, though I don't want to pigeonhole her as, as, as much more, in fact, in terms of corporate social responsibility and understanding of the, of, of, of the economics of law. So over to you, Isabel, and your reading of the film and the book. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you, all of you, for being there, uh, for accepting to uh, allow me in, because uh, I thought I was afraid that Gregor would uh, talk to me about being the CSR person or it's usually how we present me. And then I was wondering, what should I do here? Uh, should I veil myself? But I think the appropriate thing is to make a public confession. 
like uh, in the good old times. So uh, here I am. Uh, thank you for being there. The more you are, the, the, the more public my confession will be. I have studied CSR for the last 10 years. Um, and um, I hope you will forgive me about doing that. I was trying to see if CSR could be used to give uh, provide workers with leverage to negotiate with corporations. So my first question to Joel is like, should I give up? Um, now, second thing, uh, to make my confession more complete, I think I have to explain how um, deeply I have eared there. So I understand since watching the movie, I, I had a glimpse at the, the problem, but now the, the movie was a complete devastation for me. Um, CSR confers social and political legitimacy to corporation. It allows them to address social environmental issues and opens them the door of international institutions. So corporations can lobby to capture environmental and social agendas. I've learned this lesson. Second, CSR facilitate economization, this penetration of the corporate capitalist system and values into new areas so that, such as education and gym, it was the same thing for me. When I started Bridges School, I was ready also to uh, throw my computer away. I, I was watching it on Netflix. Uh, not Netflix, but the, the, the link, you know, I don't know how to put it on the TV. Third, CSR legitimized corporate self-regulation, this ultimate displacement of states and corporations use self-regulation to increase their power. In the research we did on the mining industry, unions told us how health and safety policies were used to do exactly that. So I'm getting my lesson now. What is to be done? And at the exact moment when I was completely disparate, in the movie, there is some course of action. We need to get uh, power back. Uh, we need to mobilize, we need electoral engagement, and I, we need a counter-narrative. And this was why Isabel Ferrara is here, because she has a great counter-narrative and we, we need that. But now, um, this is my second nature, as Gregor pointed out, I do economics of law. So I'm bound to be a realist and a pessimist, and uh, I don't know, maybe you'll throw the brick at me afterward, after I've done talking. We need wide scale support, but to do to gather this wide scale support to get out of just our narrow niche and of uh, academia, we need to understand the profoundness of the economic power of corporations. And I won't dazzle you with numbers just with this concept. The problem with economic power is that it puts you in a hold up position. Suddenly your capacity to earn a living to finance your retirement to work your computer is hostage to your opponent's decision to allow you to continue to use its resources. And the economic power of corporations is profound. And we need, if we want to put together some sort of coalition against corporate power, we need to win over those of us who are more, more closely held hostage to this power. I'm thinking about workers, and I'm thinking especially about blue collar workers who are not part of our Brahmin intellectual elite described by Thomas Piketty or the Anywhere Workforce aptly named by David Goodhart. I'm thinking of somewhere workers, those who have not increased their savings during the current pandemic. Warner, workers who have learned skill to work for a given corporation and depend on the continuity of their job to earn a living. Workers who need corporations to continue operating in their own town, and they will fiercely defend their rights to do so, even if the rest of the society environment is to suffer. Workers, and here I think uh, we are all included in this category, who are dependent on corporations at large to perform well if their retirement savings in the form of stocks, as Joel said, capitalism would collapse, and so will my pension. Uh, if uh, the corporate managers start acting in the best interest of all of us. So uh, we need uh, a plan to provide to the somewhere workers jobs where they may use their skills or formation to acquire new skills and a plan B for retirement for all of us to lessen our dependency on stock markets ever increasing this promise of infer increasing profitability that keeps us 
capitalism afloat. Any ideas on how to achieve this? That was my second question. Thank you. Uh, fantastic, uh, Isabel Martin. And uh, Joel will be relieved. He doesn't have to come up with his plan before uh, Isabel Ferreras comes with her counter narrative plan. So over to you, Isabel. Thank you for being there. Uh, late afternoon in Brussels. Well, hello, hello everyone. Hi, Gregor. Hello, Joel. Hi, Jim, John, Rose, Isabel. Great to see you and all the, the friendly faces uh, whom I don't see. But it's really nice to be with Cream today and um, the, the day we'll meet again. It's going to be a big party, I'm sure. Uh, it's so so cool to see you, but um, indeed from afar. Um, um, well, first, let me say uh, also that I really uh, love uh, Joel's work. I think uh, as, uh, both his documentaries have been uh, extremely uh, important to me, at least, but I can see that uh, it's been for uh, most of us today. And... Uh, and I know all uh, our students also have been uh, have been um, benefiting uh, along the years from uh, the first and now the second one. And um, indeed, the conversation is uh, super uh, interesting. There are so many things I, I would love to to add to the conversation. I'm gonna try to focus on a few points. Um, and. There is a nice segue with what Isabel just said, which is that indeed we need a plan to decommodify work so that w workers are put on a totally different footing to wage this struggle against uh, corporations. And that plan, I think, is a job guarantee. Um, so uh, I recommend Pavlina Cherneva's book on the job guarantee, which is an amazing book. Uh, but now to to go back to the the the, um, uh, the documentary, uh, I, uh, I I I'm totally with Joel on on many points, but in particular on the fact that the logic has only been reinforced uh, between the two documentaries. Uh, but at the same time, I also am with Jim in terms of hope and in terms of I think we are in a different world, uh, even though the the power of corporations obviously are uh, is uh, so tremendous today. Uh, I think one key point in Joel's um, um, analysis and 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 it's it, it's very telling in the documentary, and I think that's. That's a re really a strength uh, in in um, of it is that it's not about people and their morals. Uh, these people look actually like you know they are nice people. They're really trying to do good. They they they, they do believe in what they're doing. Then what they're trying to uh, achieve. It's really about the institution. And I think obviously as a sociologist, it's a it's a basic. Uh, a point that we learn as a, a sociology students, uh, it's really about the structure. You need to look at the structure and uh, and and the documentary really uh, brings you there. Uh, corporations are the capital structuring, the, the, the structuring of capital investment, and we have given them total power. So um, it's a bit like to let corporate so to let to let corporations rule the firm it's a bit like to let the house of lords let's say in the uk govern the country lords are the property owners as the members of the board are the property owners they are the share owners uh, but yet firms actually are political entities in the hands of those who own capital but let's remember that firms are actually made possible only because they are workers who invest their person in their work to make the product or the service exist so i think the hope really lies in the recognition that this has been the central quest of the democratic project is to disentangle the connection between 
political rights and ownership. We need to disentangle that connection. And as long as um, we don't do that, obviously the, the, the structure will be very efficient in performing what it is supposed to do, which is to bring more power and more profits back to capital owners. So uh, I think here that uh, speaking the, to the what's in the, the news in the US in particular at the moment with a big uh, 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 interest in unionization, which I think is obviously crucial because unions are really the, the collective vehicle for workers' representation. But this is vital. The, the, the struggle in, in Alabama is absolutely vital. Yet it's not enough. We need to change the structure because you know unions can achieve only what they can achieve. But if you maintain the structure of capital investment the way it works, it's not going to produce a different result. So uh, I think we should really uh, think about embedding the corporation into a, an institutional organizing where workers get power uh it's 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 um it's as simple as that almost and we should not repeat the mistakes or the at least the blind spots probably is better uh that uh, we made in history in the sense that most of the left politics has been since since world war ii very obviously has been focused on governing markets structuring them to generate fairer Comp competition, but yet uh, this is not going to deliver what we need. So, and today again in the U.S., you see a lot of discussion about um, uh, breaking breaking up corporations. I think that uh, is obviously a, a very relevant topic, and there are stellar appointments in the Biden administration working on that. Yet, this massive market power that these corporations enjoy shouldn't have us uh, not see that they will remain even broken up, they will remain despotic if, we de if they are not democratized. So that is really, uh, I think, the, the, the point that uh, uh, when you see the documentary, you get very clearly that it's about the structure, it's about the allocation of rights uh, that are now in the hands of corporations, of capital owners. And I totally agree with Joel that if we don't basically tackle that struggle, actually it's the, it's the democratic project as a whole that is in geopardy. And what happened actually in the US, uh, just, just, I mean, uh, if Biden, were Biden not elected, the U.S. was really on the verge of collapse because of the corporatization of its public political life. So it's really a choice about democracy or corporatization. I would call that capitalism, actually. Uh, the choice between democracy and capitalism is really the choice of our time because we know that the consequence is not only for democratic politics, but also for the survival of, of, of humanity on this planet. And I'll stop here. Well, fantastic, Isabel. And, and um, uh, Joel, this is incredibly frustrating. We want to do two things in this interaction. We want to give you a chance to pick up on some of these points. And clearly, you can't pick up on them all. We also want to give a chance to people who have been very lively in the conversation, the chat, uh, on making all kinds of points and see if anyone wants to come forward and uh, and make a point. Perhaps at the end of the chat, you can say, yeah, I would like to make a comment. Um, and you can do that now because it's hard to pick up the whole thread of the conversation as to who is making a comment as opposed to wanting to intervene. So over to you, Joel. We have a fantastic uh, range of issues from uh, how you how you popularize and take democracy further how you draw on the bubbling up and you systemize, systematize and take it forward, how you get plans, uh, how you embed worker power 
in the institutions of corporations, um, connecting dots. Uh, I, I'm not doing justice to the richness of the comments. So to pick up a few of these threads uh, as, as you will, and then we'll uh, open it up for some other comments from people who are listening in. I'll try to, I'll try to be very brief. Um, uh, Isabel uh, Ferraris is absolutely right. It really is about democracy versus capitalism, ultimately, and that we need to think about democratizing uh, our economic sphere. Uh, the idea in our current systems is that the economic sphere is capitalist, the political sphere is democracy. That division is has always been an ideological charade uh, and a large part of the problem. And it, it relates back to something that uh, Rosemary and John were talking about, and, and that is the, um, the fact that these companies can, in fact, uh, embrace diversity. Uh, they can, in fact, embrace some environmental stuff. Um, I think the best way of understanding what's happened over the last 20 years is that goodness has uh, been um, deprived of any class notion. In other words, when Jeff Bezos comes out and says, I, I'm a supporter of Black Lives Matter, while at the same time he's busting unions that are primarily uh, people of color who are trying to organize unions and he's working against them as what's happening at the moment uh, down in the Southern United States. Um, that contradiction can only be understood if the goodness and the diversity that he's talking about is deprived of class politics. What has happened is capital has made its class position invisible. And I think the best idea of, of the, the best way to describe that is Michael Porter, uh, the Harvard business professor's notion of shared value. So the idea of shared value is that we all share the same values, whether we're capitalists or we're workers or we're environmentalists. And, and in that very idea, we completely, make, uh, we completely make invisible the notion of class because no longer is there an inherent conflict between capital and other classes. No longer is capital even identifiable as a class if we're sharing values. So it's, it's, the, it's the, uh, the elision of the very notion that capital is a class that I think allows companies to be so magnanimous now. But when you follow the links and you ask how they're being magnanimous, it always stops at class. Rosemary made the point, why aren't the companies, but she basically made the point I'm just making. This is why the companies in Atlanta are not stepping in to stop the voter suppression stuff. They have a class interest in suppressing the vote. That was the point she made, and she's absolutely right. Uh, and, and while talking about Rosemary, I, I would say one thing about her, um, her sense that we need to take on private equity and we need to take on uh, the financial industry. You're absolutely right. One strategy for doing that, which also lines up with some of what Isabella, Isabel Mar Martin was, was talking about, one strategy for doing that is to bring um, the state and government back into public provision in a much larger way. In other words, one of the realms that private equity firms are really working in is, you know, running things like water systems, fire departments. They're, they're, this, this expansion of capital into what might be called the, the public service domains has been a huge area of growth and particularly for private equity firms. And a lot of finance, I mean, you look at a company like JP Morgan, not a private equity firm, but a lot of their work is to promote privatization. The story in the film about Detroit is all about that because they've run out of places to grow. And so, so that's what's driving that privatization bus. And that is what is, is, is really putting the power of finance onto steroids. So, so that's one idea. And I totally agree with the idea of the new federalism. It's, it's embedded in the film, uh, as you pointed out, Rosemary. Uh, we focus very much on this urban renaissance, as Juan Gonzalez describes it, for exactly that reason. And Shama Suwan, in the book I talk about this more, is very self-conscious about saying, you know what? We actually can make some headway at the local level, uh, uh, and and a great constitutional scholar, uh, John Eli, 
uh, talked about the states as laboratories um, for ideas. And you can say the same about cities and local government. So I, I very much agree with that. And it's very much um, built built into the film. Jim, um, your, um, uh, your belief in law um, and how that sits in a sort of friendly, not a, not a disagreement, a friendly tension uh, with Isabel's belief that we need to change the market, not just govern the market. Um, I think you would both agree that you need to do both and, and certainly um, that there are synergies between the two. And I'm a big believer in law. I, I used to be involved, uh, I guess I still am, uh, in what's called the critical legal studies movement in the United States. Duncan Kennedy was my thesis advisor at Harvard. And so I, I was very much part of that um, whole movement. And I, I, I was always astonished at how they were they were always tagged and targeted as being anti-law. And I always thought of them as being pro-law. They were, they were such believers in the principles underlying liberal legality, but they felt betrayed by the fact that those principles were never put into play. I don't even think they knew that, and I've had this argument with Duncan Kennedy before, but the real people who are anti-law are the corporate elites who don't want to be regulated, who don't want to pay taxes. Like they're, they're the ones who want to push law back. And so in a paper that I wrote, wrote Rosemary, in actually the Cornell International Law Journal, um, it was called The Invisible Hand of Law. And the point is, no, law is not being pushed back anywhere. Law is what creates markets. Law is what creates corporations. Law creates all of that. So it's a redistribution of legal power that we're talking about when we so-called free up markets from regulation. We're just putting more truck in the, the legal regime that enables corporate capitalism to function and less in the checks on capital's power that have been created. So I totally agree with Jim that, that uh, we need legally enforceable mechanisms to govern markets, while I also agree with Isabel, and I love her work on this, on the idea of workers being seen as investors in the firm. I mean, if they're not, who is? You know, they're not just putting in, you know, some money um, or as pensions. They're actually putting their sweat, their labor, their creativity uh, into uh, in, into the firm. So uh, it's just so topsy-turvy that somehow they're not investors and the people who don't even know what their capital is being invested in, they are the investors. Which gets back to Isabel's point, uh, Isabel Martin, um, point about, you know, what do we do about workers? They're in a town, there's a company that's spoiling the environment, but their livelihoods are based on that destruction of the environment. I mean, that is a that is a contradiction that we have in capitalism. And I think uh, Isabel Ferrara started to get at this. Isabel Ferrara started to get at this with the idea of job guarantee. And I would add the idea of real public pensions, not public pensions that will enable you, you know, to, to maybe go to the 7-Eleven and barely scratch out a living and not pay the rent, but public pensions that actually enable you to live in the event that uh, for whatever reason, your, uh, the company that you're working for uh, can't provide you a good enough pension. And I would add to that, you know, social welfare systems and public schools and public health care systems and a rebuilding of the public sector so that the, the, the power that capital derives from the desperation that people are put into if they lose their ability to depend on capital for their livings, take away that power by collectively ensuring that people are never in that desperate situation. I'm not saying that's gonna solve the whole problem, but it, it will go some way uh, to solving that problem. So the social safety net uh, is not this sort of, you know, you can barely survive in the event that capital is not coming through for you, but that you can actually uh, not only survive, but flourish as a human being because you have public education, uh, not just K to 12, but in university because you don't have to worry about your health care uh, because there's income replacement systems, there are training systems, there are, you know, the whole kind of public and social investment um, is a very tangible and I think realistic way uh, to get at that. And finally, John's point, I couldn't agree more that as academics, we, we need to try to reach out 
to broader audiences, but I also don't want to fall into the neoliberal idea that you know the broader audiences are our customers and that we have to serve them. I think that we have to maintain our integrity as scholars and as intellectuals and, and, and not become self-hating, um, but actually understand that these are super complex ideas that sometimes we have to write and think in ways that are, that are very, very specialized and that aren't necessarily accessible, while at the same time thinking about how we can translate, because I see it as an act of translation. My initial thinking is always in the academic scholarly realm, and then it's like I need to translate this into a language that somebody who doesn't have three law degrees um, can 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 relate to and be moved by, not just not just thinking, but but be moved by. And that's not patronizing. That's just recognition of the fact that something happens when we spend 12 years of our lives training to get PhDs in economics or sociology or whatever. We we do become specialized, and and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because these are very complicated ideas. But so we have an obligation both to hold on to what's important about that specialization and at the same time uh, try to communicate uh, those insights in a broader way than, than only to people who share uh, that specialized knowledge. Wow, two wow. minutes left. I have, to, I have to start a constitutional law class in two minutes. We really want to thank you for this, Joel. Now, I wasn't sure whether you could make it to to 40 or 30. You're saying it's 30. I'm saying it's okay. 29. OK, 29. So uh, first of all, we want to thank Joel. Um, and, and I think that what that means is, is unfortunately, to J.F. Huff and Jonathan Preminger that uh, we're going to have to frustrate you here. Uh, but I'll ask any of John Rose, Isabel, Isabel, and Jim, if you have a parting comment. Just thanks uh, to Joel for his fabulous work and Gregor for pulling this uh, together. I think it'll amplify it in lots of audiences. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I think I think we need to respect the fact that uh, uh, a constitutional law class is a constitutional law class, and some people find one hour long on on Zoom and other kinds of calls. We've done an hour and a half in a very interactive way uh, with apologies to the audience for yeah. not bringing you in in this respect. But if you take a look at the chat, uh, there are a lot of interesting questions happening there too. I think we really want to thank all of our panelists here for stepping up to the plate uh, and uh, uh, for bringing this conversation forward, which clearly we want to take forward uh, and it's and it's critical. Uh, so. Uh, thanks very much to you all. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you all. And I really look forward to doing something like this again sometime. This was fabulous. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you down the road. Bye -bye. And for those thank of you who want to continue, you. Joel, can they FaceTime into your constitutional law class? <laughs> I'd say yes, but I have no idea how technically to make that happen. So okay, anyway. great. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks to all.